Uh, I'm Giuseppe. Um, I work for Pivotal. And I'm Julia, and I work for SAP. And we're here to talk to you about uh, how Garden has grown in the past few months. So first of all, what is Garden? Uh, Garden is the containers engine for Cloud Foundry, uh, Concourse CI, and Bosch Lite. So you might, be, you might be wondering, what is a container? Uh, a container is effectively a way to distribute applications. And in the industry, we've been trying to solve this problem for quite a long time. And uh, I think the way, uh, the, the reason containers are so successful is that they provide uh, two things. They provide isolation. So basically, you know that your software will be isolated from anything else that runs on the same machine. And also encapsulation. So all the dependencies that your software requires uh, can be shipped with the software itself. Uh, how do we do this? Uh, the Linux kernel has been providing um, primitives to uh, achieve containerization for quite a long time. Uh, in particular, uh, the Linux kernel provides uh, namespaces and it provides uh, C groups. Namespaces basically allow us to limit what a process on the system can see, and C groups can allow us to limit what a process can do on the system. And uh, in Cloud Foundry, we've been using this primitive for, for quite a long time. Uh, we used to have this uh, containers engine called Warden, which was written in Ruby. Uh, then we rewrote it in, in Go, and we renamed it to Garden. And uh, it, it was all good and great, uh, and then one day, uh, uh, Docker happened. And uh, it, kind of, it was very disruptive for the whole containers. Um, community because they were they were not using anything different than us they were using exactly the same primitives as as garden but what they did was they provided a very good user experience for them so suddenly everyone was able to just take containers ship, ship them around uh, manage them very easily and it kind of it made containers very popular and docker itself became very popular to the point where like it kind of became this de facto standard for containers and at some point, we at Cloud Foundry were like, maybe we should use Docker as well. And, and we did try. Uh, the problem is Docker isn't really a, uh, it's not, it's, it hasn't been conceived to be reusable. So it's very opinionated, it's quite big, and it's monolithic, it's not very modular. So we did try and we basically failed. Um, luckily, um, some time passes and um, the Open Containers Initiative uh, gets created then. And, and the op what the co Open Containers Initiative did was basically, first of all, establish like a standard format for containers, which was really standard. And uh, they also released a reference implementation for it, which is called RunC. And mm -hmm. RunC is, is exactly the opposite of what Docker is. It's a tiny binary. It takes a config file, which complies to the spec. It produces a container. That's all it does. Incredibly reusable, small. And so that's what we did. Uh, basically, we decided, OK, we're going to get rid of all our containerization code and just replace it with calls to, to RAMC. And this marks what we call the, the beginning of what we call the year of glue, um, where like we basically Garden is not it stopped being like a, like a complete containerization solution, and instead it's, it's an abstraction on top of an existing uh, containerization tool, in this case RAMC. Um, does this mean that Garden is useless? Uh, not really. Um, Garden still makes a lot of sense as an easy to use abstraction on top of this, this standard containerization technology, which allows the consumers to just be, be stable. They don't have to change when the underlying containerization technology changes. Uh, also, it allows us to provide our own security defaults. Uh, and in Garden, we try to turn on as many security features as possible by default. Uh, this is an example of a few that we do turn on by default. Um, and this is like a comparison with other container products uh, in the, on the market and how like we tend to uh, be a little, bit, a little bit more keen in enabling security features by default. Um, yeah, now over to Yulia to talk about what is actually new. Yeah, so now thanks to Giuseppe, you know what Garden is, but how did our garden actually grow in the last few months? So we've been actively working on three main tracks, and those are CPU metrics, container D, and rootless. And I'm quickly going to go through the first one, which is CPU metrics. So you're probably wondering, so Cloud Foundry already has this functionality, right? When you do CF app and the application name, so you get some numbers about CPU. Um, and you're right, we have that. But the current approach currently has a few problems. 
So um, the main problems are three, kind of. So the current metrics are a bit confusing. Um, the other thing is that applications can actually affect the performance of other applications, which is not perfect. And the third thing is like life is super hard for operators. Um, and I'll quickly go through the different problems. So first one, the confusing metric. So let's say you have an application and you push that application to Cloud Foundry. And when you get the information about the CPU, you see, okay, this application is currently using 40% CPU. Then you push the exact same application that's consuming the exact amount, same amount of CPU. And then all of a sudden you see, boom, 200%. So what's wrong here? So the current approach um, has this problem where it actually it depends on a few factors that are not visible by the user. Um, for example, on how big is the Diego sale or what kind of other applications are running or the same Diego sale or if other applications land on it, that will affect the current approach. Um, so um, yeah, uh, when you get this information, you don't, you don't actually um, gain any information because um, you have no way of knowing how much CPU your application is currently using or um, how much it actually needs or when you need to actually scale. So users don't have the answer to the different questions like, how is my app performing right now? Is my app going to perform well, perform well on prod? Is it going to perform, perform well if it lands on a different sale or even if it continues to run on the same sale? And it's impossible for them to auto scale on the inf information that they're currently getting. So the second problem is, um, oops, wrong direction, sorry. So <laughs> um, the second problem is that if you, high, if you have high CPU applications, and by high CPU applications, I mean applications that are constantly using high amounts of CPU, that could negatively affect normal applications. So let's say you have a Diego cell and you have 10 applications of the same size running on that Diego cell. So in theory, every application gets around one-tenth of the CPU, so that's their fair share. And in theory, all of them should be able to spike over that fair share when they need to, so you'll be allowed to use more than you're entitled to. But what happens if all of the applications on that Diego sale are consuming as much CPU as they could possibly get? So that means that you'll never be able to spike over that threshold, and that could lead to real, really poor um, user experience. And the other problem is that both the applications, so the one that it's constantly using high amounts of CPU and the one that's idle most of the time, they pay the same amount of money, which doesn't sound fair. In order to fix this, um, operators have to do something. And so they have to build this perfect world where every application is able to use their spike CPU, so all of the CPU that they need. Um, and that's hard. So in theory, that should be super easy because you depend on the fact that not all of the applications are using 100% of their CPU all of the time. But in practice, if you have those high CPU applications running on that Diego cell, that won't be possible. So what operators normally do um, is they just simply overcommit. So they give um, enough CPU for the cell so uh, all of the applications can use their spike CPU like 100% of the time. And that's a lot. And someone needs to pay for that. Um, we try to solve that problem by introducing um, a maximum um, fair CPU. Um, so what that is, uh, you have this uh, maximum CPU shares that you get, um, and you can spike over that, and that's relative to the memory that you're getting. Um, but so, so that's to, to the CPU shares. But that's a bit hard because you have to find this perfect value where um, it does actually something, because if the value is too high, that means that all of the applications can spike a lot over their entitlement, and that means that you're not doing anything. If it's too low, that means that all of the applications won't be able to spike over their entitlement, and that causes problem, because what problem are you, so what, what, it doesn't give you any solution. Okay, so those are the problems. So what do we want to achieve? Um, the first thing that we want to achieve is we want to make the CPU metric understandable. So that means that when the users see a number, for example, 100%, that should mean for them, okay, right now you're using all of the CPU that you're entitled to. If they see 105, that should mean, okay, now you're using a little bit more than you should be, but that's okay because there is some spare CPU in that machine. But if you depend on the fact that you always get this CPU, then you should consider auto -sc um, scaling your application because you're not guaranteed to always get this. 
The second thing is bad applications don't affect good applications, and good applications shouldn't get a decreased performance from what they used to get until now. And the third thing is make life a bit easier for operators. So that means that they should feel really confident that they provision enough CPU for all of the applications to spike when they need to without having to provision as much as I described a few minutes ago. And that sounds really good, but how do we plan on doing this? So the thing that we did is we introduced a thing called CPU entitlement for each container. So that means this is the CPU that you should be normally getting. We actually implemented this already, and there is a new metric in Cloud Foundry. Um, we didn't change the old one. We exposed a new one that can be consumed through a plugin called CPU Entitlement Plugin. So the reason we didn't change the old behavior, we introduced a new one, is because the behavior is like really different. Um, um, so. Um, the problem with the new, so if you have um, an application which is using 25% of the host CPU, the old plugin will always show you 25%. It doesn't really matter how, you're how much CPU you're entitled to use. But the old plugin, uh, the behavior will be a bit different because if you're entitled to 25% and you're actually consuming 25%, you'll get 100% in our plugin. If you're consuming 25 but you're entitled to um, 50, then you'll see 20, uh, 50%. Um, so um, this entitlement that I was talking about, um, it's currently relative to the memory as it used to be. Um, there is a mapping that can be configurable by the user, by the operators, which is a Bosch, -like, a Bosch property. Um, and we exposed that um, property. We tried to write a really good doc uh, describing how operators should set up that property um, because it's not that trivial because operators need to know information like how big the Diego sale is and stuff like that. Um, and we also put a sane default, uh, which means that if you want to have a perfect, uh, so an optimal system where all of the applications are guaranteed to get at least their entitlement, they would be able to do that. So we um, split the um, actual implementation in three phases. So the first one was the, meaning, the meaningful uh, CPU metrics. The second one was the operations tooling. So um, at this phase, no throttling will actually happen. So um, we only we are only going to create the tools that operators can use to see how the system is currently behaving. So they should mark applications as under or over entitled. So operators at the end should be able to give us some feedback um, if our algorithms work as expected. So if we're marking the over and under under entitled applications as such. The actual entitlement will have, uh, throttling will happen on the first, on the third step. And there are a few key points here. So no matter how you behaved in the past, you are always guaranteed to get at least your entitlement. So even if you behave like really bad in the few, in the last months or so hours or the last ro rolling period, um, you will still be able to get at least your entitlement after that. Um, the throttling will actually happen when you have um, multiple applications that are trying to spike over their entitlement and there is not enough CPU for all of them. So the thing is that the preferences and bursting above the entitlement will be given to applications that and containers that behaved good in the past. So the thing is that you gain the ability to burst by being under, uh, under entitled and you lose it by being over entitled. So for example, if you have two applications that are entitled to use 5% of the CPU and um, one of them was using 10% in, in the last few hours and the other one was like being idle most of the time, then you give privilege to the good container to burst. The next track that we were working on is Container D. So as Giuseppe mentioned, um, Garden wants to be like glue between different components and we just want to be a super thin layer around everything and we want this layer to get even thinner and thinner. And Container D was a nice opportunity to do that uh, because both we and they, um, we use Run C for container creation and lifecycle. And we also have this layer wrapper around this Run C, which is common between us. So at some point we decided, okay, why don't we just get rid of this layer and just use that logic from Container D uh, because that is a repository that a lot of people are using. The community is actively contributing to it, testing everything. 
And we also get the nice opportunity to contribute something back. So if we found some bugs and stuff like that, we can just bring that back to the com community. So the way, because of the way things are implemented right now, that wasn't hard and we we were, po we were able to do this change incrementally. So for example, container op lifecycle operations like container creation and destruction are currently happening through container D in CF deployment by default. The other step was process operations, so when you run a process in a container. And this is currently experimental, but it's already implemented. And the third step um, is to get rid of our image plugin. So the image plugin is the component which actually takes an image, for example, uh, Docker, and turns that into the rootfs of your container. And we have this component, which is called rootfs, and now we would be able in the future to just totally get rid of it and start using the snapshot logic from container D. And now Giuseppe will tell us a bit about rootless. Okay, so um, we've talked about security earlier and how like we are enabling all these security features for every container that uh, we create uh, in Garden. And this is true, so our containers are actually quite solid. Uh, but as soon as you get to a very secure door, I think you should start worrying about the wall, because that becomes the next more likely target for, for an attack. And in our case, uh, the wall is called garden server. So the garden server is actually still running as root, which means if an attacker manages to get control of the garden server, they will have uh, basically unlimited power on the system. And we don't want that to happen. <laughs> so we've been putting in lots of work into um, being able to run Garden as a, a non-privileged user. And this would mean that even if an attacker got control of the server, there will still be an unprivileged user on the system. We also have no, not much power to, to, to make too much damage. Um, uh, th this, is, this is actually uh, done, and it's uh, currently uh, under test. Uh, the way we've done it is, is explained in detail into this other talk, which is called The Root to Rootless, and quite a few of our team members have uh, delivered this talk uh, in you know, all sorts of conferences, uh, so I encourage, it. I encourage you to go and check it out. Uh, please just pronounce The Root to Rootless, never say The Route to Rootless, because people back in London get very upset if you do that. Um, uh, so as soon as, we, as, soon as we, get, we, we got this ability of running as an unprivileged user, um, Another interesting opportunity was, well, we, we, can, gar we can run Garden into its own container. Uh, and it can be an un a normal, unprivileged container. And this is exactly what we're doing. We're leveraging BPM, which is this new process manager for Bosch, uh, which effectively runs every Bosch workload in a container, which is, by the way, well, like it's, it uses Run C under the hood. And uh, so if you deploy Garden with, uh, with Bosch, you can use BPM and run, and run Garden into its own container. Um, of course, uh, as Julia mentioned, we are working on a container D backend. Uh, so we, we do want both these, both, both these things, so uh, rootless mode and BPM for container D as well. So we're working on that as well. Uh, and finally, uh, so working on all, on all these amazing features, we, we, it, it just happens that we, we got to stumble on all sorts of like weird behaviors of the kernel or the operative system. Uh, things don't work, just don't know why. So you spend like maybe weeks uh, investigating and then you find out like very interesting stuff about the uh, how Linux works. So we decided to share this. Um, we've published a couple of blog posts and we definitely intend to do, to do more of that uh, in the future. So to recap, uh, we've seen how Garden is effectively an easy to use and secure by default abstraction on top of well-established standard container technology. We've seen how we're fixing the way we measure CPU for containers and the way we allocate it as well. We've seen how uh, our glue is getting thinner and thinner uh, through container D, and we see how we're getting more and more secure uh, by running rootlessly. And finally, how uh, we're also trying to share what we're learning uh, uh, through our blog. Oh yeah, this is the attribution for all the emojis you've seen in the presentation. Uh, they are from this project called Streamlined UX. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, me and Yulia are going to be hanging around uh, if anybody has any questions. Thanks. Yeah.